In the 2010s, women are still breaking through centuries of tradition to become, for example, the first woman editor in the New York Times 160-year history, Jill Abramson, in 2011. The first managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, in the same year. These breakthroughs are mostly described by news media in positive terms. But why undermine Lagarde's achievement by describing her as the Beyonce of international finance, on the grounds that she wasn't a real feminist from the point of view of a particular journalist? Both gender and patriarchy rely on the idea that our biology determines our place in the world, that it motivates us to act in certain ways, desire certain things, as if all women, and indeed all men, are exactly the same. But we know from our own experience of living in the world that this is not the case, that we are more than just our sex. Two terms which are useful to consider in understanding these essentialized notions of women and men are heteronormativity and intersectionality. Heteronormativity refers to the idea that the sexual norm is heterosexual and every other form of sexual identity is deviant. Intersectionality, on the other hand, argues that we need to understand how all our attributes including ethnicity, class, age, geography, and sexuality, need to be considered as influencing how both we think of ourselves, but also, crucially, our life chances. Here's how the Swedish Secretariat for Gender Research defines the term. Intersectionality relates to the observation that power structures based on categories such as gender, race, sexuality, functionality and class interact with each other in various ways and create inequalities, discrimination and oppression. One single power structure cannot be understood in isolation from other power structures. The term was coined in a discussion on how social movements tend to not recognise the conditions for people who fall between the categories. One example is how both a white feminist movement and a black anti-racist movement risk missing the conditions faced in particular by racialised women. Discrimination based on race and discrimination based on gender often co-occur and are difficult to separate. Today, intersectionality is used as a theoretical point of departure and methodological aid within research, activism and practical work of change. As a response to gender inequalities, in the media as elsewhere, a range of initiatives have been developed to both measure the scale of the problem and to identify solutions. For example, gender mainstreaming is a means by which, at a policy level, differences between women and men, which could result from particular policy decisions, are taken into consideration. Here's Age's definition of the term. Gender mainstreaming is the reorganisation, improvement, development and evaluation of policy processes, so that a gender equality perspective is incorporated into all policies at all levels and at all stages by the actors involved in policy making. Mainstreaming a gender perspective is the process of assessing the implications for women and men of any planned action, including legislation, policies or programmes in all areas and at all levels. It's a way to make women's as well as men's concerns and experiences an integral dimension of the design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of policies and programmes in all political, economic and societal spheres, so that women and men benefit equally and inequality is not perpetuated. The ultimate goal is to achieve gender equality. Gender mainstreaming is a complementary strategy and not a substitute for targeted, women-centred policies and programmes, gender equality legislation, 
institutional mechanisms for gender equality and specific interventions that aim to close the gender gap. However, as I have highlighted, gender mainstream is only one part of the process of recognising existing inequalities between women and men, because we also need proactive measures to reduce them. In some European newsrooms, including in Sweden at SVT and in the UK at the BBC, the number of women and men who contribute to news stories are now being counted and recorded. These data are being collected at regular intervals to determine any patterns of unconscious bias and to shift the balance to make contributions more evenly spread between women and men. Other strategies include setting quotas and targets for promoting women into media management positions, sometimes also called positive action initiatives. In most countries, this means that when a choice is given between two equally well-qualified candidates, the woman will be selected as a means by which to address the historical lack of women in senior posts. Gender-sensitive indicators have also been established as mechanisms whereby organisations can measure how well they are performing against a set of criteria, which usually include aspects such as the number of women in the organisation and their status, the existence of gender equality policies, positive support for women's career advancement, and so on. Within a media context, UNESCO have devised a set of gender-sensitive indicators for media, GSIM, which seek to enable media organisations to make gender issues transparent, encouraging them to look inward at their own operations and practices, and to provide a tool for assessment, goal-setting and monitoring progress. It works as a resource for training media staff and as a mechanism to inform gender-related policies and strategies. Although focused on the media, the GSIM could be used across many sectors. So far, I've mainly talked about the problem of gendered language and institutional responses. However, the rise of digital media has enabled citizens and women's organisations to challenge gender-based language and reporting strategies which gloss over or underplay the ways in which women's lives and experiences are given less value than those of men. Such initiatives are particularly noticeable when it comes to the reporting of violence against women, both offline and online. Consider some of the popular terms which are used to describe online acts such as cyberbullying, trolling, harassment, revenge porn and stalking. None of these terms include the words violence or abuse, which is what they actually are. And using the term bullying in particular serves to diminish the seriousness of such actions on an adult. Why are these acts of violence not described as such? In the same way, using the term revenge porn to describe the circulation of sexual images without the consent of the person featured, almost exclusively a woman, suggests that she has done something which excuses or even justifies such a vengeful response and can thus be seen as a variation on victim blaming. These kinds of reporting strategies serve to undermine both the acts themselves but also the impact on the person who's targeted. In response to such misnaming, a number of alternative terms have been suggested, including cyber exploitation, cyber harassment, cyber stalking, and the catch all cyber sexism. In addition, and not exclusive to reporting violence against women in the online world, many feminists and some journalists now routinely use a survivor narrative to describe an individual who experiences violence is not killed by her attacker.
changing the language from victim to survivor gives dignity to the survivor and focuses on her agency and resilience without downplaying the seriousness of the crime. Language matters.